Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and by now you've probably heard about a little accident one of the Russian rockets had on basically its launch, and um, today we're going to talk a little bit about what happened, I'm going to try to explain some of the facts and also maybe clarify some misconceptions and talk about this launch specifically, and what it really means to the Russian program and to, I guess, international space community in general. Anyway, let's talk about this, and today we're going to actually use a little bit of uh, Kerbo Space Program to try to recreate some of these launches, and I'm gonna show you what went wrong um, during this particular launch, and what actually happened um, to the astronauts and to the capsule itself. First of all, uh, this is not really that rocket specifically, and uh, this is a type of a Soyuz rocket, very similar to the one that was launched, but actually much older. This is a much older design, and uh, the reason I'm using this particular design is because unfortunately I wasn't really able to find the newer version of the Soyuz FG type. Now, this is Soyuz, um, I believe, uh, from back in like 90s or early um, 2000. Uh, it's the one that was right before the more recent FG version. And there's actually quite a lot of Soyuz rockets out there. As a matter of fact, this particular design is the most successful and most actively used rocket ever. It holds a lot of uh, records out there. And uh, this particular shape is basically uh, based on the Soviet ICBM known as R7 that was actually, as you can see, developed back in 1957. And the actual shape hasn't really changed that much because it was relatively successful. It was originally developed by um, a Soviet um, space scientist, essentially. Uh, this guy right here, Sergei Korolev, he was uh, the basically the brains behind the operation. He was the major uh, rocket scientist back in the Soviet Union back in the days. And this is technically his baby. And as you can see, this is actually the Soyuz rocket that was used quite extensively during the early um, astronaut era. And the more recent one looks like this. So in terms of the actual shape, uh, everything is pretty much the same. There's a bit of a change uh, in the upper part, the actual escape mechanism, the uh, um, the one that basically was responsible for saving the lives changed a little bit, but everything else, well, I guess colors are different, but everything else is pretty much the same. Well, anyway, let's actually try to see if we can maybe launch this rocket and try to recreate part of the mission here and basically see if we can maybe kind of make it to space with this, but I am going to try to initiate the abort procedure here just so you can see what actually happened. So there were actually two astronauts here, uh, and this is why we need to get rid of one of these guys. Uh, one of them is going to have to stay on the planet Earth, and that's going to be you right here. I don't know who you are, but you're out. Goodbye. Probably not the way that Russians did it, but Nevertheless, it's pretty close. Uh, one of the reasons there were actually only two astronauts um, is because of the um, funding problems that Soviet, or not Soviet, but Russian space agency has been actually having in the last few years. And so only one of the Russian um, astronauts was on the rocket. The other one was from the uh, American space program, NASA. Uh, so here, what we're going to do is we're going to launch this and try to basically recreate the initial stages. So the rocket actually launched just fine. Um, as a matter of fact, if you watch the uh, report that was in real time, um, everything was going as planned and the rocket was kind of lifting just normally. There was absolutely no errors reported. And the astronauts, if you actually watch them, um, were totally relaxed and actually enjoying their flight. And let, let me actually show you one of the fragments from the video that was actually right here. So as you can see, they're totally fine. Uh, one of them is uh, checking the telemetry on this little iPad looking device. And uh, here's, here's the interesting fact. Uh, you'll see that they actually have these toys here, which is kind of unusual, right? As a matter of fact, they do have uh, two main purposes. One is kind of to relieve stress, but the more specific purpose is to see if there is any weightlessness going on. And this is exactly what kind of saved the astronaut's life. Uh, at some point, um, the actual booster stopped um, being active and the toys started floating around and the astronauts knew something is wrong because it's not supposed to happen. And this is when the actual um, alarm went off and you actually see this in a few seconds in, um, I guess, right now. Uh, the toys will actually start floating and this is what indicated to both NASA, uh, Roscosmos and the astronauts that something was going wrong and the actual booster separation failed and the rocket was no longer getting any thrust. And because of this, they had to abort the mission. Actually, the computer had to abort the mission. 
And all of this actually happened right uh, milliseconds before this autonomous uh, separation system, actually, this is uh, what saved their life, uh, was supposed to separate and kind of disappear. And normally this is kind of how it goes. First you use these boosters, these boosters run out of fuel, uh, then they kind of separate, this thing releases, and the emergency launch escape mechanism um, also separates as well. Now this is kind of like the normal procedure, but um, as you'll see in a few seconds, this is not exactly how things uh, went. So during a normal launch, uh, from the ground, this is actually what you'll see, uh, just a fire cross in the skies, because the Soviet or the Russian systems don't actually put cameras on their uh, rockets, like SpaceX, for example. Um, and mostly because uh, this is such a node system that it's been tested and proven for many, many years. And it just so happens that um, because of this particular incident, this actually showed us that this is literally the safest rocket um, in the world. It's kind of counterintuitive, but let, let me get back to this in a second. Now, this is the moment when you can actually see something went wrong, because as you can see, the toy star always started floating around and the cabin started shaking a lot, and this is not supposed to happen. And right after that, there was an explosion with the uh, boosters separating in a very unusual manner. Normally, these four boosters actually separate in a very, very uh, symbolic cross-like formation. It's actually known as Korolev's cr uh, cross after the inventor of this rocket. And I'm going to um, demonstrate this to you uh, later on. But for now, let's actually see how all of this kind of uh, happened as the rocket failed. Now, so at this point, the rocket is moving um, at almost two kilometers per second, close to about two kilometers per second. And it's approximately 50 kilometers or actually 56, I believe, uh, above the surface. And this is when these boosters are uh, separated because they essentially run out of fuel. Now, right before the booster separation, this system right here is supposed to essentially separate as well because it's, it's, it's extra weight. You don't really need it. So normally, this happens and this happens. And that's basically a successful launch. And this continues into space and basically then the Soyuz capsule um, is supposed to reach uh, the International Space Station in approximately six hours. But in reality, what happened was around 90 seconds into the flight, uh, NASA and I'm guessing also Roscosmos received a signal from one of the boosters saying something's wrong. I don't really know what, but not everything is going to plan. And uh, the system automatically launched the emergency evacuation procedure that I'm going to try to demonstrate to you in a few seconds. Um, this was actually right after the boosters ran out of fuel and normally around 117 seconds into the flight these boosters are released and three seconds before that this whole thing is released in other words the emergency system actually is released right before the boosters but in this particular case what happened was well first uh the boosters did get actually released but in a completely wrong fashion then the actual um fairings came off and uh lastly what happened here was that the emergency system which is this big thing right here, um, which is essentially a huge engine with solid fuel in it, activated and released the capsule that had the astronauts in it. And uh, in other words, this capsule separated. I'm going to try to do this right now. And was... Was... Okay, come on, you can do it. Activate. Activate now. Okay, here we go. Not exactly how I planned it, but okay, let's try this again. I can do this better. First, the emergency system activated and uh, we're going to activate it manually. And then the actual capsule was released. And as you can see, it actually moved away from the ship very, 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 very fast. This particular booster uh, right here, this uh, emergency um, release system is extremely powerful. And this is essentially uh, what saved those astronauts, uh, not actually just this one time. Uh, the first time it actually happened was in the, um, I think it was 1983, on the actual launch platform, something went wrong with the one on the previous Soyuz rockets, and um, this particular uh, release mechanism actually saved the astronauts from being, uh, well, essentially killed by the, uh, by the explosion of the rocket. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, these two astronauts, the Russian astronaut of Chinin and the American Haig uh, were actually now stuck in this um, very interesting capsule 
in a ballistic kind of a trajectory, returning back to Earth. And at this point, they were safe. But the thing is, because it was an uncontrolled sort of descent, uh, and because they were going uh, not fast enough to actually have control over a capsule, but also uh, not slow enough to essentially not feel any Gs, they were going through some extreme, extreme conditions right now. Actually, the conditions here were approximately seven Gs of uh, force. And that's that's really painful. And they were experiencing this for at least several minutes. Um, they were actually uh, descending from an altitude of, I think it was around 60 kilometers at this point. Uh, okay, this, this is actually a little bit in inaccurate. Uh, but um, they were moving down toward Earth really, really fast. And... We're going to see if we can actually recreate this right now. Um, they were basically falling onto the empty uh, deserts of uh, Kazakhstan. And uh, they ended up uh, landing around 400 kilometers away from the launch site. But actually, luckily for them, in the location where normally they retrieve astronauts anyway. So the actual uh, services were ready to retrieve them. And it didn't really take long before they were able to um, essentially uh, get to the capsule and help the astronauts basically get back home. Uh, ironically, as, as I was watching the report uh, that was produced during the launch of this capsule, right before this, ac this accident happened, uh, they were actually just talking about the actual mechanism responsible for saving lives and how this all works, and literally seconds after it actually happened in real life. Uh, so here, here's the interesting fact about all of this. First of all, this actually now uh, solidifies Soyuz rocket as the safest rocket in the world. Um, it literally means that after close to about a thousand launches, um, it was able to actually save astronauts twice. It had very, very few failures. And uh, where's my parachute? Here we go. Uh oh, did I lose my parachute? Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, my Soyuz is not as safe as the real Soyuz. Uh, huh, about that. Okay, maybe maybe it's come. It's going to maybe it's going to deploy after. Oh, here we go. Okay, never mind. Whew, false alarm. Uh, anyway, so what I was saying is that um, this basically solidifies Soyuz as the safest rocket in the world. Uh, it managed to save astronauts twice. Um, unlike shuttle, for example, space shuttle, uh, which actually had two major disasters that ended up costing lives of um, close to a dozen uh, astronauts. And this is actually one of the main reasons space shuttle was actually shut down by NASA, because it was just unsafe. Uh, the actual emergency procedures for shuttle were very, very, um, let's just say, convoluted. They were very complex. This particular solution actually is what is going to be used on the future NASA missions, um, the SLS system that is going to be uh, launched, uh, I guess, maybe within the next year or so by NASA it has a very, very similar launch abort system uh, right here. And uh, it's been tested and retested many times and we know that it works like magic. Although one of the more complex uh, launch abort systems is actually on the upcoming uh, Dragon version 2 of SpaceX that has uh, the abort system built into the actual capsule, uh, mostly to save money, but also because apparently it actually works really well. It, it was tested back in 2015. And, and here's actually a video demonstration of the actual abort system uh, being activated, uh, and it does work. It, it will most likely save a lot of lives, and um, it's one of the reasons SpaceX has so much chance to become the dominant force now, because even their emergency system is very, very efficient. But going back to our astronauts here, they're still basically falling to the ground. And as a matter of fact, um, the uh, astronauts that were launched on this rocket uh, took about 34 minutes to land on Earth because they were coming from some serious heights. Um, I'm sure they were freaking out and I'm sure they were swearing and screaming, but nevertheless, they survived and the... First pictures on the ground showed them basically walking normally, nothing was wrong, and here they were chilling on the couch, basically smiling, kind of, unofficially. Uh, now, the sad part about all of this is that because of this failure, um, there's a very high chance International Space Station might actually become unmanned for the first time ever. Uh, the astronauts currently there need to return to Earth soon unless we extend their mission. And um, because there is actually no one else coming, or at least there's no planned mission uh, for the next few months, uh, we might end up having a completely empty station, which would maybe be a good test for the actual station as well. Um, but these particular astronauts in this particular capsule were supposed to stay there for six months. This, they had a lot of missions planned. There was a lot of interesting things they were going to do. But I guess, alas, it didn't work out. And well, I guess this is going to be a good test for the space program of both NASA and Roscosmos to see how we're going to solve this problem. 
But let's talk about some conspiracy theories and kind of maybe uh, something related to one of the previous articles that was posted about a hole that someone drilled in one of the Soyuz capsules that was found on the um, Soyuz capsule that was um, actually attached to the International Space Station. Uh, this is one of the reasons the ISS was losing a lot of air. And now we have this unusual accident. So are they connected? Well, I guess we'll soon find out. So maybe there is a sabotage going on, or maybe these rockets are just really old. And my honest opinion is that, um, yeah, they're really old. As a matter of fact, this program is technically about to finish. Uh, Soyuz FG has been around for pretty much, what, 17 years now. And officially, Roscosmos was actually going to retire them next year. And it's most likely going to accelerate now because the whole program is being replaced by the new rocket known as Soyuz 2 that you see on the screen right now, uh, probably one of the more ugliest rockets I've seen in a while, but also apparently a very efficient, very, very safe rocket that's going to be launched in 2019. Now, this is supposed to replace everything and it's supposed to be cheaper and more efficient. Um, but I guess uh, what is really good about this particular program is that, well, don't fix what's not broken, right? Uh, it's been working fine for pretty much over 50 years now. And it looks like the Rose Cosmos is going to stick to this uh, strategy, to this particular design and to these types of rockets, because as demonstrated by this mission right here, it seems to be absolutely safe to uh, cosmonauts. This was the first time ever we were able to actually activate the emergency system mid-flight and basically safely retrieve astronauts from literally um, upper atmosphere, practically space. It has never happened before. And uh, both previous uh, disasters, uh, space shuttle disasters happened around the same altitude. And as, as we know, they cost a lot of American lives, unfortunately. So in this sense, uh, this particular design is actually still going to be kicking around for a long time. And it's very likely that Soyuz is not going anywhere. And with this one failure, it basically puts the Soyuz FG failure rate at 1.5%. Um, it's actually about half of what previous Soyuz rockets had, and at the same time, much less than pretty much most major rockets around the world. We don't really know how safe SpaceX is going to be when it starts launching people, but we know that SpaceX actually has had quite a few failures as well. And uh, for now, this or I guess not this, but the rocket that launched this um, is essentially the safety winner. Now, our beautiful Kerbal astronauts are about to land in the water here, although in reality, they landed in the desert, but there you go. That's the end of this mission. And essentially, I guess a start of new era for the Soyuz rockets. But in the next few months, we'll hopefully find out what actually happened on both this rocket and also the Soyuz capsule uh, that was um, on attached to ISS. Because if it's sabotage, it's actually pretty serious and might actually end up uh, raising some serious eyebrows about security, uh, both at Roscosmos and I guess space industry in general. But if it's accidents, if it's just unusual events that were mistakes uh, made by maybe engineers or just the fact that the rockets are so old um, and the facilities might be old as well, all of this needs to be investigated just to improve the future designs. For now, though, um, I'm actually kind of interested in hearing more about how all of this progresses. But uh, most importantly, I'm actually looking forward to seeing how this ugly thing right here is going to fly as well, because uh, it really doesn't look like it, it can fly at all. But that's, of course, me exaggerating things a little bit. Uh, the cool thing about this particular design is that now um, it can be launched from a lot of other places where previous Soyuz rockets could not be launched. So there's a high chance that this is actually also uh, going to be exported to a lot of countries. Uh, these are much cheaper than uh, other rockets and also can be built by nations that currently don't have uh, actual space capabilities. And so maybe that's actually what Roscosmos is planning. But anyway, on this particular note, uh, let's launch this beautiful beast again and see how it goes for us this time. And uh, yeah, well, maybe next time. Anyway, thank you for watching. Hopefully you learned something about this mission and the failure of the beautiful Soyuz rocket that's about to crash here near Kerbal Space Center. And also, hopefully now you know a little bit more about... Uh, oh boy. About both Roscosmos future missions, future rockets, and also the actual accident itself. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Subscribe and maybe even support this channel on Patreon. Space out, and as always, look at them, they survived. Bye-bye.
I told you it was a safe rocket. See, they're still fine. They can totally just walk around and go and do some science now. <laughs>